Thank you all for being here. After a two-year pause with the State of the Cities, we are back and ready to rock and roll. So excited about that. My name is Robin Anthony. I'm the Executive Director of the Greater Stillwater Chamber of Commerce. Um, just a few highlights about the Chamber today. Uh, we are currently still at over 500 Chamber members, which uh, lands us as the largest Chamber in Washington County, so we're really proud of that. We have a lot to offer here in the Valley, so that's pretty awesome. Thank you, and if you're not a Chamber member, we'd like to invite you to become one. Uh, we are an inclusive organization uh, that serves, promotes, and advocates for our business community while enriching the lives of all of our communities that we serve. Last year, we did form a foundation which allows for events like this, education, leadership programs, certain community events, which affords us the opportunity to give back to our community in forms of scholarships and several other ways of giving back. Um, we are currently looking for a grant writer for our foundation, so if you know of anyone, please uh, let me know. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Leadership in the Valley is in its third year, just graduated the third cohort, uh, that brings us to about 60 participants that have gone through the leadership program. It is a community program, leadership program, that serves the entire uh, St. Croix Valley. It's a wonderful program. If you're interested, we are taking applications for the cohort that will start in September. Um, our fire chief has gone through it, and uh, he was in our founding class, and he serves on the steering committee. And he was born and raised here, and he continues to say he learned a lot more about the community than he ever thought that he would. So it's pretty awesome. We also are launching a young professionals group called HYPE, Harnessing Young Professional Energy. That will be launching at the end of May, so we're really excited if you're under the age of 40, which I am clearly not. Um, we would love to have you join HYPE. Uh, this is our future, and so we really want to learn from the next generation how they want things done and how they are going to lead into the future. Our upcoming events, we have our food truck event, which is June, I might screw this up, 17th or 18th? 18th. 18th, Saturday, that's at the Washington County Fairgrounds. We have 35 food trucks. We all love to eat. We also have a beer and wine tent, live music all day. We have military row there, marketplace lots of activities for the kiddos. It's super fun, so come on out. A part of the proceeds for that goes to scholarships for the trades, which is uh, obviously a, a, a good uh, way to support our uh, future leaders. This year, for the first time, we are doing Lumberjack Days Parade, and uh, that is July 17th. And we've not done that before, so the locals approached the chamber and said, you guys know all the businesses, why don't you help us out? So we went to the board of directors and they said, they said sure, let's go help them out. So we are looking for sponsors for the parade um, and also units, participants. It's such a great tradition in the St. Croix Valley that we want to continue it. Uh, we have a golf tournament August 8th at Oakland. And the first weekend in October is our Rivertown Fall Art Festival. We've been doing that for over 30 years, another, another um, historic event here in the Valley. And of course, our World Snow Sculpting Championship is coming back in January 2023. We are looking for sponsors for that as well. And if we did sign a three-year contract. This is the second year. We did it during a pandemic, so we're really, really looking forward to what we can do uh, in post-pandemic mode. Today's sponsor is Remac Professional. I'm going to have them come up here and let's give them a round of applause and thank them. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having us. Um, we are Remax Professionals. We just moved into the Sauntry Mansion right up the street. Um, our grand opening is Thursday at 3, if anybody wants to come. Uh, 
I might, I, I gotta add too, uh, we had to rezone this from a and b as a residential use into a commercial use. Um, and we worked with the city of Stillwater and it was a very nice smooth process. So um, it was good. So we're happy to be here and happy to be in the Sauntry Mansion. Come if you can um, to our open house on Thursday. And enough about us, let's talk about the market. Everybody wants to talk about the market right now. Um, so supply of homes is what this chart is. It goes all the way back to 2008. This is the monthly number, so generally when you're reading the paper, they talk about the annual number, so they take the 12 trailing months before each month. This is the monthly, so this is gonna show a quicker uh, change in the numbers. So you'll see that the last kind of tick where it goes up there, that's April. And so the supply of homes was under one, which is the bottom gray line, and it just passed up over one. Um, so this is a great news because this may slow down the multiple offers and the bidding and the values going up really, really fast, which I guess could be bad news too, if, depending on how you look at it. Um, so this could be the pendulum starting to swing the other way. Obviously it's not a skyrocket, it's a slow, gradual turn. So um, keep an eye on that. Um, just to give you an idea, you're probably seeing headlines saying, oh, sales are down 10%, which is true. Um, but if you look at the historical number of sales, you'll see that um, we were actually the highest year on recorded history since 05, which is when we started tracking it. So it being 10% down from the best year ever, not so bad. Um, so April 2022, the annualized numbers, so 12 months, 64,000. In April 2021, it was 65,900. Um, and in April 2020, it was 61,000. So we're still doing pretty good. We're not, it's not a housing crisis at this point. That's what the statistics say, not just a sales guy. Um, this one, uh, it's not great quality, and I'm sorry, um, I was at an event and, and this, the stats on here were, I think, pretty great. Um, so the top lines, the, the blue and the dark, or the dark red and the dark blue, um, are the average and median sales prices. And the bottom gray one that kind of hovers at the bottom, that's the median income. So you can see that the prices have skyrocketed, I guess that's a bad word. Um, well, they have doubled since it started, um, but that median income is not. So um, as of the end of April, we were still affordable from the metrics that, that we use, um, even with the rate increases, but um, I anticipate that we'll kind of peak out here and see some shifting. Um, this one was also from that same meeting, which I thought was really interesting. Um, median new single family home prices by state um, we are the most expensive in the in the region here, even more than Chicago or Illinois, which I thought was interesting. Um, I took this at an event that was with builders and realtors together, and so there was some lobbying behind some legislation, um, and this was an illustration to the effect that it's very expensive to build a house in Minnesota, so um, whatever reason it is, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, Stillwater's market. Um, your median sales price is up 17% um, since last April. Bayport um, probably had some large sales, which makes it look like the prices went down, but the prices didn't go down. Uh, your median price just went down because of the number of sales in the high end and the low end. Um, Lake Elmo up 11 from April 2021. And Oak Park Heights had some high end sales, look at that, up 44%. And these are the realtors that work out of the Sauntry Mansion right up the street. Um, so if you're looking for professional help, um, please call one of our agents. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for sponsoring. This is gonna be a great event. Um, we are really lucky to have this group of local leaders here. Um, keeping in mind today our focus is more about the business community and what's going on in their cities. Uh, this is local government. They are not lawmakers, uh, state or federal lawmakers. So let's be respectful of questions during Q&A. Um, let's kind of keep things like climate change and gun control and the prices of gas out of the Q&A. They are here for you, serving you. and. Uh, they certainly will take meetings and, and like to hear your opinions, but let's kind of 
keep the questions if we could around the business community and what's going on in the cities. Um, let's introduce a panel. So uh, we have Mayor uh, St. Boris from Bayport, uh, her city administrator Adam Bell, uh, the mayor from Lake Emma will be coming shortly, his city administrator Christina, Mayor McCumber from, and they're from Lake Emma, Mayor McCumber from uh, Oak Park Heights, City Administrator Eric Johnson, Mayor Kolskowski from Stillwater, and his new City Administrator, yay us, uh, Joe Coleman. So with that, we're gonna go in alphabetical order, although we are going to start, uh, skip over Lake Emo until the Mayor gets here. And um, take about, you know, 10 minutes, give us an overview. We'll listen to all the cities and then we'll do some Q&A. Thank you, Robin. Thanks for our sponsors. Um, I'm Susan St. Orr's Mayor of Bayport, but I'm also on the Chamber Board of Directors, so wearing two hats here this morning, um, accompanied by our City Administrator, Adam Bell, and also we have a, a council member in the audience, Michelle Hansen. So, um, so good morning. another shot. So we're very excited this year that uh, Bayport is celebrating its centennial anniversary. Um, we were originally incorporated in 1881 as South Stillwater and we'll be um, celebrating our 100 year anniversary. Oh, I'm sorry. We might have to shut this off. It's going to provide feedback. Okay. Do you try turning the volume down a hair on the system? Um, I don't know where that's at. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. I'm going to pause here for a second so I don't hurt your ears. Do you do all the presents? Do you have any idea where they always set it up? Are we good? Can you turn the volume down on the PA system at all? Should I give it another shot? Sure, I just think that might be too close. Um, maybe stand up over here. There you go. Yeah. Nope, nope, nope. That doesn't have anything to do with it. Turn towards it. Turn it towards it. No, turn it the panel. Susan, just keep it a little lower. There you go. All right, so our 100 year anniversary. So we're super excited about that, and there will be activities to uh, to celebrate throughout the year, primarily at our Derby Days, which the Bayport Community Action League uh, puts on for us in the September time frame. Actually, that's September 16th and 17th. We'll be adding um, centennial activities to our street dance. No? We don't know yet. <laughs> There'll be some amount of celebrating, but... So, um, but, so look for more details throughout the year, but it's um, pretty exciting that we're, we're celebrating that milestone. Um, the Bayport, last night we held our first Bayport uh, business community engagement session um, where the full council um, was opening up the conversation with our business owners to understand their, their challenges and um, what they would like to see from the council. It's a very engaged session. We had a small group of businesses, but open the door for further conversations. So we'll be hosting another open house with our local um, members and uh, responding to what we, we took in last night, what action or, um, or information we have to share with them as a result, and then moving on to additional topics in the near future. So that was a really wonderful uh, first step. It was a priority for, out of ours, one of our uh, late strategy sessions to get more engaged with our business community, and uh, that was a good first step. <coughs> We are returning to our Memorial Day Parade, um, so please plan to join us. Uh, that is um, put on by our American Legion, um, Hens uh, Hesley, uh, Jensen Post 491. Um, we did not host our parade for the last couple of years due to COVID, but um, it's Monday, May 30th, of course, at 8.30 a.m., so please uh, join us for the parade and then the uh, ceremony up at the cemetery that follows. 
Our Bayport Farmers Market is um, starting on June 13th and will run through October 17th at the Village Green in downtown Bayport. Returning to Village Green from Barker Elf, so right in this heart of the city, uh, please plan to join us every Monday uh, evening. Again, Derby Days, if you have not taken that in, um, it is a fabulous uh, celebration. We, we would be so, um, we're so grateful for the Bay Park Community Action League and all of the activities that they put on. It's a small group of, of uh, businesses and community members, but they do phenomenal work. And so there's a street dance uh, on September 16th, and then set the 17th, there's a whole day of family-friendly activities, followed by the best fireworks in the valley. They're personal, up close, in our uh, Lakeside Park. So. Um, I do encourage you to come and join us, and there's always fun activities right up until the moment of the, of the fireworks. Um, it is really um, Americana at its best. We are, as a city, we're conducting two important infrastructure studies this year. Uh, we have a waterway <coughs> study, which we haven't done for about 10 years, and then we're also doing a stormwater drainage uh, study. And so these will help us um, better assess, you know, our infrastructure, um, our rates, making sure that we are in line um, to sustain all of our processes um, and uh, have good uh, objective information to make our, our decisions. So those things are underway. Um, you know, we are very, very fortunate that, we, in, um, that our city is almost at capacity. We are the final phase of inspiration. We're the villas of inspiration, and there's only like three or four lots and then we will be built. So there, we do have one, um, one uh, opportunity for re, uh, redevelopment, and that is our old fire hall. We currently work hand in hand with the Department of Corrections, and they use it to house uh, their transportation vehicles. But that may um, change at some point in the future. We you know, so we're looking for ideas, um, opening up the doors, just having that conversation. No uh, definite plans of of making any changes with the DSA at this moment, but that property at some point will be open for a redevelopment. And so if you have good ideas, you want to come to Bayport, um, step in and chat with us. So, um, is there anything that I missed? No, we don't have any big street projects? Or no, not this year. Well, planning is going on. We did do the bar crawl, too, for the business site. Oh, okay, so just last, just last Saturday, uh, the BCA also did a, ball, a bar crawl that um, went from our six different businesses that serve um, alcoholic beverages and food, and uh, it was a great turnout and a beautiful day and, um, and a, a business-friendly type of activity put on by the BCA. So, what would you bring to this? Well, the other thing I would reiterate is uh, this year Bay Park is doing a lot of planning, uh, long-term planning, uh, as the mayor mentioned, the infrastructure planning, uh, some financial planning. So that's really what we're focusing on for future years. Good morning. I'm Mary McCumber, Mayor of Oak Park Heights. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, Eric Johnson is our city administrator, and then I see Chuck Doherty, who is on our city council, and our city attorney, Kevin Sandstrom, and I don't know if I've missed anybody else. I don't see any. Um, some of the things that we have going on for this year is, um, just like all the rest of the cities, we're finally returning to our party in the park, uh, which brings out all of our, some of our businesses and our residents, and come out, have a good time, have a hot dog, uh, get in the bouncy house. I don't know if any Chuck might joining on that one this year. <laughs> and that'll be on Thursday, June 9th. And I know there's quite a few other big events going on in town, so we'll be well fed that night. Um, this year we also have a new park programming director, uh, Annie Barris, and she has come up with some fantastic ideas for things to do in parks, which is always on Tuesdays for the children. But she also has some family events, like a pajama party and a movie in the park. So wear your pajamas and bring your children. Um, and, and all the information on that is on our city website, and it's been going out in our city newsletters as well. Some of the big things that have been going on, and I think everybody's already noticed uh, what's been going on on Norell and 36. Um, 
that will have a safer access for all of the businesses that are located there to not have the frontage road so close to the main line of 36. It'll be into a roundabout, so hopefully the traffic will move smoother. Right now we have a little bump with 58th Street that, you know, because it is the alternative route, um, many people are backed up, obviously, trying to get out of Menards or trying to get out of Coles. And, um, it's just a little bump for now, and hopefully it doesn't disturb too many of our businesses. We want everybody to come to Go Park Heights in particular. Um, and then we also have a couple other things that are going to be going on with uh, just mill and overlay, our general maintenance things, water tower, you know, the cleaning of the water tower by City Hall. And um, the other big thing that we get a lot of questions on is um, the retirement of the King plant. It's going to be retired in 2028, which is uh, quite a bit sooner than our city was ready for. We were told 2040, and it's now 2028, so there's a lot of scrambling for planning. The King plant contributes 40% of our tax base to our city. It doesn't just affect Oak Park Heights, it'll affect the school district, county, how all that distribution goes. So our city put together a, an advisory committee that was looking at future of what could be at that site. Um, once the plant is gone. Could it be residential? Could it be marina? There's been a lot of different ideas. Nothing is in stone yet. Um, I was appointed to the Energy Advisory, a Transition Advisory Committee um, through the Department of Economic Development and the Secretary of State's office to keep working on alternatives and timelines with Excel. And I know Mike Will and Ali from Excel is here um, to continue those conversations that this, it, there isn't a big burden on our city taxpayers when that does retire. Um, oh, since our last uh, sec, uh, State of the Cities, we have a new police chief, Steve Hansen, which we were great to get from Stillwater. <laughs> <laughs> and he has hit the ground running. He's doing a fantastic job, a lot of community outreach, so we're very pleased to have him on board with our staff. Um, I can't think of anything else that we, oh, we do have quite a few different developments that have contacted the city and much like Bayport were to build out. We don't have a lot of land or new developments, but there's a lot of opportunities for redevelopment and we've had different ones contact the city. So stay aware, we might have some new businesses coming to town in the next few months and a couple of things I think will be coming to the planning commission this month for the next thing. So, and welcome the new businesses when they do come here. And I think I caught it all. Did I miss anything? No, I No, I I well, think I add on to what the mayor said about Morel is that affects everybody in our community and I think the council started working on that in two thousand seventeen. So these these projects take a very long time to develop and I know the mayor worked very hard in lobbying the council, our staff, um, to get state aid, to get grants. And pull that stuff all together, and we hope it works out. It should be great. Right? <laughs> so that's it. All right, thank you. And, and thank you guys for the. I know uh, we know in Stillwater how hard it is to work with MnDOT and everybody else to get those interchanges done. Ours across 36 is the next big project that the city of Stillwater is looking at. So when, when they get it all figured out, then we're, gonna, then we're gonna try and do our end of it as well. I think everybody has experienced the pain of that intersection. So, so you wanna learn from our mistakes? Absolutely, <laughs> that, that's what we do. Um, uh, so thank you for that and, and congratulations to the Port with your centennial coming up. And that's 100 years from the freedom of, from the tyranny of Stillwater. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of their, their independence day down there. Um, but yeah, so what, you know, we haven't met for a few years. I'm sorry, I'm Ted Kozlowski, Mayor of Stillwater, for, for those that may not know. Um, we, we had the pandemic, right? That's something that happened uh, since, since we last met. Um, I, I've got to say the, the, the community, uh, really trying to be focused on the, on the business community, you all really pulled together um, for, for the betterment of our, our entire community, the entire River Valley during this. And, and a big thanks to Robin and those of you at the chamber um, to step up and help with all of the efforts that we had downtown and lighting the bridge, keeping Stillwater and, and the surrounding community active and busy year round. I, I know we had some business owners that said January 
of last year was their busiest month of the year. We, we kind of crushed it um, during the pandemic from a, from a business standpoint and keeping that activity going. And it, it wasn't all by accident. There was a lot of hard work behind the scenes from, from many volunteers uh, to do those things. So uh, I'd like to report that I think that the state of the city is, is relatively unscathed um, after the pandemic. We, we worked together really well, um, which again is also relatively new. I've been on council almost 10 years now. And the relationships that we have with our surrounding communities, like with the things we're doing up here, the relationship that we have with the chamber and our downtown businesses um, has never been better. And a lot of that's due to Robin's hard work and, and, the, and the other members of the chamber coming together and, and making all of that happen. So thank you to all. Um, I, I think collectively we did a really good job in a really stressful, tough time. Um, it, as far as specific to Stillwater, um, we do have some new hires. We've got our brand new city administrator, Jill Coleman who's absolutely awesome, completely hit the ground running. Um, this absolutely wonderful guy, and I know many of you will get a chance to meet him if you haven't already. We have our new rock star chief, Brian Mueller, our police chief, um, who we're really fortunate to have here in Stillwater. And again, from a, from a public safety standpoint, I think, you know, with, with uh, Steve Hansen being the new chief at Bayport, or at, at Oak Park Heights, I'm sorry, and the relationship with our county sheriff and public safety. We've got Stu, who's absolutely Chief, Chief Glazer, who's amazing. Um, and our fire department is awesome. I think everybody's working together, along with Lakeview EMS, who's also an awesome organization. I think everybody's been working together. Um, I, I was at the, the police memorial uh, this past week, and a couple of the, the officers kind of were talking about how what we have is a very special thing. It's like we have this bubble in the East Metro, in Washington County, um, where everybody's really working together, good relationships with all the different departments. And again, that's, that's relatively new as well. Um, so just really fortunate to live where we do and, and want to thank our public safety folks for, for keeping us safe and, and doing what they do. I think we just have an absolutely outstanding team across the board and across the valley right now. So we should all feel fortunate for that. Um, some of the, the fun stuff. So Lumberjack Days is coming back. And I heard we booked Metallica. No. <laughs> As the chief runs out the door. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, not a lot of details on the lineup just yet. But um, you know, I, I suspect it might be a little more dialed back than we've seen in years past. Um, just because you know, Lumberjack Days is put on by volunteers. It's a hundred percent fundraised event, so they have to raise all the money for the bands and. And for everything they do, it's not a for-profit enterprise like it has been in years past. Um, the, the locals are doing this really as volunteers and then putting those dollars, any dollars from the beer tent, go back into the event or back into the community. But again, really happy to hear that the chamber is stepping up once again to, to help organize the parade for Lumberjack Days. So it's just really nice to see everybody working together on that event because it's, it's a tough, that's a big event. It's a, it's a tough thing to plan for. A tough thing to manage, and I think one of the, the issues we've all seen how busy our downtown has been with absolutely nothing going on. Right? I mean, if it's nice out, there's almost more people downtown than there were in lumberjack days of, of old um, in downtown Stillwater. So it's almost anything we do is going to draw a pretty significant crowd these days. Um, so that, that's something we're working on and, and trying to balance and mitigate that and maintain the community event that, that it really needs to be and has been while still, you know, enjoying and, and welcoming our guests from, from out of town. Um, so I'm really excited for that to go on. Those are definitely some of my favorite days of the summer in Stillwater. Um, the 4th of July fireworks are back on um, this year, which is great. Councilman Polina, thank you for always putting that together. Um, so we've got a new city administrator, a new police chief. We also have a new community development director. His name is Tim Gladhill. I know some of you have had a chance to meet Tim, but again, also awesome loads of energy um, and doing a really good job. Um, our, our number two, Abby, just left to go be the, the number one community development director up in Forest Lake. She's absolutely amazing. Um, definitely wish her all the best and, and really excited for her and that big step up. Um, so we're missing a number two right now, so just be patient if you're doing anything development-wise in the city of Stillwater. Just be a little patient with us right now. Um, and then um, 
Yeah, I think, you know, council's been pretty consistent. Uh, Larry Odebrecht, Councilman Odebrecht, is, is kind of the new guy here, and, and he's done a really phenomenal job. I mean, frankly, he did better than I certainly did when I first got on council, and, and hitting the ground running and, and working with constituents. Everyone knows Councilman Polina. He's, we call him Councilman Christmas or Councilman Fun, because he's really the guy. He's the brains behind all of the fun stuff downtown Stillwater, the Christmas lights and the tree and all that good stuff. And then Councilmember Junker is here as well. And he's really just the man about town. Every, I promise you, every person in this room has met Dave Junker at some point and had a conversation with him. Um, but he, he is all about everything downtown and working with our businesses. And so I, I, we have a really, really good, strong council right now. And it's, it's really a pleasure to work with all of you. And I would say the city's in pretty good hands. As far as projects go, you know, there, there's a couple of the, the big things that I think will, you know, one, we've, we've all noticed the trail work that we're doing downtown. Um, I think that's going to get wrapped up in the next couple weeks is kind of what we hear, but the river, two weeks, but the river's coming up, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll see, um, you know, that that's a big project. I mean, the, the gist of that trail project wasn't to widen the trail, it was to cover an exposed sewer line for the benefit of Oak Park Heights and our friends in Bayport, because 100% <laughs> of what goes in our toilets <laughs> runs in a pipe down along that river that was not supposed to be underwater. But because of erosion, more or less the river going up and down a little more frequently than it has in the past, um, that pipe became exposed. And so the, the gist of that project was to ensure the safety of the St. Croix River. And again, you know, we, we like our friends downstream too. So um, that'll get wrapped up here pretty soon. I would encourage you, while construction's there, let your friends know Stay, please stay off the trail. We've been marking it closed, and, and they're moving heavy equipment down there. And people still, they just go right past the closed sign, and then they stop construction, and have to make sure everybody's safe, and it's been kind of a pain in the butt for, for the folks that are working down there. So if you see somebody down there, friends, just kind of keep people off the trail until that's done, because it's really kind of slowing things up for us. Um, the next big project is the, the Chestnut Street Plaza project. So that's right at the foot of the lift bridge. This one's gonna sting a little bit. Um, it's, you know, we, we had, I mean, Chuck is well aware of the tempo of construction in front of his business <laughs> that we saw with, with the rehab of the old bridge and, and the restoration project um, and as part of the new St. Croix River Crossing project. And I mean, it felt like we had cranes and construction stuff downtown forever. And so when that project finally wrapped up, we had a really fun celebration. Of course, Councilman Fun over here uh, put that together. But we, we, had a, we had a great party, and it was like the end of construction downtown Stillwater. And it's like, oh, <laughs> we're, we're, do, we're doing it again. But it, 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 the end result is going to be amazing. I think I, and we've had several chamber talks where I think our, our former community development director had shared the plans and the visioning for that, but basically. Chestnut Street, um, east of Maine, is going to be a pedestrian plaza, and it's going to look absolutely beautiful and, and stunning, if, if only we could keep the skateboarders out of there, right, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and that's starting up here soon. I, yeah, so I guess we're, we're getting bids on June 7th, but it, it will be during our summer months when we start. <laughs> tearing things up down there and replacing things. So just, again, please bear with us. There's, going to probably, there's definitely going to be some closures on Water Street. It's, there's going to be some disruption downtown. But again, it's kind of timing is everything. With the bid environment right now, um, I know staff looked at pushing this. But as many of you know, I, I'm not betting on things getting cheaper anytime soon. Um, and, and certainly the cost of borrowing money is not getting cheaper anytime soon. So we really needed to get this done now. Um, and, and so that's where the timing is at on that. There, there's a couple of other things that you'll, you'll hear us talk about. We just brought them up in our last council meeting. But one of the, the main goals for the city, I think, and it, it's not a this year goal. It's, it's not even a next year goal. But it's, it's a conversation that's going to take a few years where we really need to look at other mechanisms to raise funds to do the fun things that we want to do in store. Right now, the only mechanism the city has for revenue is property taxes. 
And frankly, it's not a very balanced scenario in the city of Stillwater. Like more or less 80% of our tax base is residential, 20% um, is commercial, so it's very different from like Oak Park Heights, where they just said 40% of their tax base comes from itself. Um, and, and right now, the, the biggest expense, always the biggest expense of our community is maintaining downtown. Right? We have, a, we have an old, beautiful, historic, vibrant Main Street in downtown that requires the bulk of work um, in the city of Stillwater. And so the residents up the hill are the ones paying for a lot of the amenities that we see downtown, and, 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 and I fully support that continuing. Um, but we're, we're looking at two mechanisms just as options, um, and, and both of them need to be driven by the community, so it's not something that the council can just implement, so don't worry just yet. Everyone's going to have a chance to speak up on these things, but the, the two other options, and in many cities, and many of you are probably familiar with the first one, but it's basically a sales tax override. Right, so we have the opportunity to go to our voters and ask our voters if they would agree to a quarter percent or a half percent sales tax override. Virtually every city does these things, right? Every large city across Minnesota has one of these. And they range from you know a percentage down to a quarter of a percent. Those funds have to be used for a specific project. That's capital stuff. You have to go to the legislature after you go to the voters. So the water voters would have to agree that we do this. Then we go to the legislature, and depending on the tempo there, they have to agree whether or not to allow us to do this. Um, but it would be an additional, it would be just right on top of additional sales tax. So you'll, if you've been to Minneapolis or St. Paul or Woodbury or, I don't know, like there's a, a few dozen cities that have already done this, you'll notice that you know, your, your bill is maybe a quarter higher on your $100 target bill. Those dollars have to be used again for a specific purpose. So we have a major lighting project that we need to do downtown that has a price tag north of about a million and a half dollars to make all of our street lights consistent and beautiful. There's little things like that. When we look at you know public like a, a public docking, which is something I hear a lot about, right? A splash pad downtown or bringing the fountains back downtown. All of those kind of amenities. Um, could be eligible for funding from a sales tax override. And, and a lot of those things would be focused on downtown to the benefit of downtown. So even though we all want them, and we could just raise everybody's property taxes to pay for these things, um, but lots of little things add up to a pretty significant number. And in the city of Stillwater, that number is $90,000 roughly um, that we add to our budget, raises everybody's property taxes in town by 1%. Right, so a million dollar project is a 10% increase on everybody's property tax bill, more or less. It adds up relatively quickly, and Stillwater's been running pretty mean and lean, and, and of course we want to be very you know, financially conservative and responsible. Um, so you can see where some additional funding might help. Take the burden off our taxpayers, and then maybe a little on our visitors, right? Um, so that's one option we're looking at. And again, at this point I'm not advocating for it, it's going to be a community discussion, though, right? And it's something that our voters will have to pass. Uh, the second thing we're looking at is, is basically a special taxing district for downtown. This is more for, this would be, this is relatively small. And again, this would have to be driven by the downtown business community. So the chamber, and Chuck, and all the businesses downtown would kind of, they'd have to approach the city more or less and say, this is something we want. Um, I know White Bear Lake uses that. So that's often frequently cited when, when people call me to, express their concerns or feelings on snow removal downtown when not every sidewalk is perfectly cleared or when the snow banks start to get really high because MnDOT trucks do a really good job of putting lots and lots of snow up on Main Street sidewalks. The city of White Bear Lake has a special taxing district where they pay for their own snow removal, right, and take care to make sure every downtown street and sidewalk is consistently clean and they've got extra garbage receptacles and they put out salt for all the businesses that they can share to, to keep downtown clean. The other things we could do with a special taxing district are more maintenance items. So right now, Councilmember Junker and Councilmember Polina, especially Councilmember Junker, have to go run around raising money to, for the bridge lights and to get permission from every business owner to put lights on the business on Main Street and to get permission and the funding necessary to light up the Stillwater lift bridge. How many people enjoy that? Right? It's, it's a wonderful thing, right? It's going to be really hard to make that sustainable. Right? It, there's, a, there's a pretty significant cost to the city and to council members' time in doing that. And, and again, we're all here, you know, we're all elected, 
you know, I can't imagine not having the same council over the next few years, but eventually we're not going to be on council anymore, and there might be somebody that doesn't want to go to every business and ask them if we can put lights on their building. And so, you know, funding those kinds of things, the, the, the light show downtown Stillwater, the Christmas tree, if we want that to be consistent year over year over year without it being kind of a nail-biting effort of fundraising driven by a handful of people, this is something that a downtown, a special taxing district where every business owner is chipping in $500 a year kind of scenario or whatever it is, we figure out a, a list of things people downtown want that we don't want to shoulder the burden on people living in Croywood, and, and we built that out. So again, I'm, I'm not here to advocate for any of those. I'm personally, I don't know if, if they make sense yet, right? So we kind of have to figure out what we want to do with those dollars, uh, and then figure out the best way to allocate those dollars. And maybe it just is on the property tax rolls, but um, those are those are going to be part of the, the two big conversations that we're going to be having in, in the city very soon that will impact. You know, and we'll want your feedback on all of these things. So I, I think that's kind of it. There's plenty more, but you know, I'll, I'll be here all day. <laughs> but with that, I'll pass the mic to Joe. And I know we, we always get really good questions, or we've had really good questions from this in the past. So I'll, I'll let Joe introduce himself and then uh, look forward to all of your questions. Uh, well, I'm Joe Coleman, new city administrator for the city of Stillwater. I've been on the job for about 60 days now. Maybe one more thing to add, uh, kind of building off what the mayor was talking about. The city did create an economic development authority uh, where our community development director, Tim Gladhill, will be making <coughs> business, business, sorry, business visits to uh, inventory the needs of the local business owners. Uh, so look out for Tim to reach out to you uh, in the very near future so that we can kind of bridge the gap between the city and the business owners and see where we can do things better. Good morning, I'm Charles Cadenhead, uh, Mayor of Lake Elmo, just to step in after the uh, Stillwater information here. Um, lately, I don't know if people have read about, but we have a building moratorium in part of our city in the southeast, part of our city south of basically the road, uh, railroad tracks between Keats and um, Manning Avenue. And that's due to a couple of factors we need to make sure that we're um, in line with water appropriation for our city and and maybe read in the paper about different things revolving around White Bear Lake Avenue and I know it impacted uh, Stillwater a little bit and it's impacting Oakdale, uh, Hugo, North St. Paul and Oakdale um, where the DNR was talking about limiting certain amounts of water and the, the judge said no I didn't tell you to do that so um, thankfully, Senator Housley has some language in a, in a omnibus bill that may help us out. But we're we're trying to get a new a new pump for some water, and, and in that we need we're building a water tower in the south part of uh, of the city to make sure we have back pressure for all the residential and commercial uh, businesses down there, the new developments that are going on in in um, in the Royal and all along 94 there's a lot of pressure for commercial business and some residential businesses and or residential um, developments in there so we need to make sure that that those are uh, appropriately done you know our comp plan shows section between keats and lake elmo avenue on the south side getting water in 2030 people are wanting it in 2022 so things are progressing fairly quickly down there um recently we uh we have a some property that we, we acquired from 3M over on the west side of town next to Oakdale. Uh, recently just had an AUAR done on that, an environmental um, research document that kind of lets people know what's there, what's there geologically, what they're gonna need to do. So we'll probably be looking for some development in that portion on the north side of Casaw 14 where our public works facility is. And we, we think we can, uh, we can get some good Good development in there. Um, recently, our uh, we do have an EDA in, in Lake Elmo, and we're doing some um, visits. The uh, EDA members themselves are doing visits to <clears throat> businesses in Lake Elmo, much like what Stillwater indicated. We're checking in with them to see, you know, what they would like to see in the future. 
how, how they envision things just to get touch the base, more of a business retention type effort on our EDA. Um, this year there's quite a bit of uh, uh, construction going on in, in Lake Elmo. We do uh, quite a bit of work. We have quite a few county roads that, that, that touch our city. And um, internally we have uh, probably nearly 100 miles of just street, city streets. And we've doubled our investment this year as we found that we have gotten a little behind on maintenance procedures. So we're, we're doing a lot of crack sealing and a lot of chip sealing this year um, uh, to, to get things back in order and, and then create more of a pavement management plan for, for Lake Elmo. We're finishing up sewer connections in Old Village, Old Village phases five and six in our downtowns. So that's kind of the final step in getting um, and some of our residents hooked up to, to sewer in the Musa district. Um, that should be completed at the end of this year. And then finally, um, we're building a new city hall. Uh, we, you know, as a city, we've we've grown quite a bit. We're uh, I think population in 2020 we're a little over 11,003, and Met Council has us uh, 2030 being a little over 18,000. So there's a lot of growth that's supposed to be happening, and so we're building a new city center. We'll have a new fire hall for that. It'll be really nice and centrally located, so we can get uh, quick um, times to to fires or emergencies, things of that nature, and uh, we'll be able to have more. City events, community participation, it'll be much larger than our current space that we own. Um, the fire hall will also have space for full-time firefighters, and uh, as we're, we're seeing that need in our community, and it's harder and harder to have part-time or, or uh, uh, volunteer firefighters. It's just the generations change, and then people change jobs. So. Uh, we're looking at a spring completion next year, and uh, <coughs> looking forward to that. So I think that's about all I got. I'll maybe just emphasize some of the development opportunities that the mayor touched on. We've got over 100 acres, as he mentioned, on Ideal Avenue north of County Road 14. That is going to be guided for business park use, commercial, a little bit of residential as well. And in Lake Elmo, business park isn't just your typical um, office warehouse, but you know. It could be a restaurant, it could be a daycare. We have a lot of um, options in there uh, for, for different types of development. And then uh, along with the new city center next year, you know, we'll be looking for opportunities to redevelop the current city hall and the fire station that's downtown. So a lot of opportunities to, to grow with us in Lake Elmo. Great. Can you hear me? Thank you, thank you. Uh, and it's so good to meet you in person, Mr. Mayor, uh, from Lake Elmo. We uh, met via Zoom. Remember that old Zoom? Um, back in the day, and it's just a pleasure to have uh, Lake Elmo at the table, so thank you for being here. And I also just want to thank all of you for your partnership during the pandemic. I neglected to do so earlier. I don't ever want to relive that ever again. It was most painful sad thing ever to listen to the business stories and having to deal with personal things as well, like all of us here in the room. Um, but we are moving on up, and I love the fact that you all work together, it's great. One of my favorite collaborative efforts that is done is a day after uh, Thanksgiving when all the fire trucks come around with Santa on and you know the departments work together. And speaking of fire departments, ours is celebrating in Stillwater here 150 years which is uh, really, really great. I know two of the fire chiefs had family be leaders in the fire department for years, so we are hosting a ribbon cutting at noon at the Stillwater Fire Department. All are welcome. So uh, thank you again. Uh, on that note, what kind of questions do we have today? Here we are. You have your local government at your fingertips. This is where I get my steps in. <laughs> Let's do the, the ribbon cutting is June 3rd. June 3rd. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, ribbon thanks, cutting Dan. on June 3rd at the fire department. Yeah. And ask who, who, who it's for. I will. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's, my name's Bob Dickey. I'm the development director for the Connect Center. It's a nonprofit here in Stillwater. 
<clears throat> and this is really a question for the entire panel, whoever wants to deal with this. Um, thanks to our Remax, Remax sponsors today, we saw uh, kind of a, a couple slides about the costs of living in this community and how that is really going up a lot. <clears throat> One of the things that impacts the sustainability of business is its ability to attract and retain employees. And when housing becomes so expensive that they can't, employees can't afford to live here, we're in a competitive metro area that they can go somewhere else. So we have a combination of high housing costs and lack of public transportation, which is kind of the double whammy for sustainability <coughs> for business owners. Uh, could you all talk a little bit about what kinds of zoning things and what kinds of ideas that the communities might have to help uh, people of modest income uh, live in your communities? I think, Bob, I'll, I'll start because I'm closest to you. Um, in, in Stillwater, we're, we're like a couple of like a couple other communities, were pretty well built out. Um, if, if there is an opportunity for more affordable housing, it's going to have to come through redevelopment. Um, about the only area that I see that might be an opportunity for that would be the old Lakeview Hospital campus, right? That, that's significant. It's large. Um, Joe and I are actually meeting with their new CEO this afternoon. Um, not to talk about that, but to, to talk about their expansion plans and everything else. Um, but it, it is, I, I can echo the pain. I, I've heard it, um, especially from our friends in the hotel industry um, and some of our larger restaurants, and I guess some, a lot of our smaller restaurants, too, are really struggling to, to find employees. I mean, that, that's the biggest pain point they're having right now. And it's those two things. It's affordable housing and, um, and lack of public transportation. And so, you know, public transportation is not something the city of Stillwater can handle on its own. And so maybe in collaboration with fellow communities, members around here, you know, there, there might be an opportunity for something regional in the future that I think would make a lot of sense. Because I would like, you know, it, it's one thing to have a bus to Minneapolis or to Maplewood, but I, I would still like to keep our employees relatively close, right? And, and the needs of our community relatively close. And so I, I, I think it's a good idea, but it would take a very huge, massive collaborative effort with all of us. Um, but it, it's certainly a pain that I hear um, with, with the lack of the housing stock. There's no question. I guess I could add to that too. In No Park Heights, it used to at one time be, you know, pretty affordable to, to move here, but the, the market has driven the prices of, of what the houses are. So once was easy for a first time home buyer to get to, it's now 300000 It's not your average first time home buyer. We also heard build out. Um, there are no residential lots left in the city. I think there's one. Um, but everything else is either business or multiple. And we did get someone approach the city about building an apartment building, um, but they have not put an application in yet. And I think that was for 83 apartments. But what they would charge, I don't know. But it would be nice because it is close to the business district on 36. So we'll wait and see. But right now, our hands are tied. We really don't have an opportunity to um, have low, lower for um, first-time homeowners or people who would be able to work at some of our businesses. It's unfortunate. So in the city of Lake Elmo, it's, um, you know, it's a lot of older community, but we do have a lot of room for growth, especially on the, the south side um, of the city near I-94. Uh, unfortunately, right now we have a moratorium because we don't know if we can get water based on the uh, White Bear Lake court decision. So we do ha get applicants to come in. We have some high density, medium density in there. We do understand we have a lack of variable housing options. And I think last time I checked, the median house in Lake Emma was around four hundred thirty-five thousand dollars, and that's just not. I mean, that's not something a starter can get into. Um, so we do, you know, we've got areas where we can put up some apartment buildings and we can put up some villas or townhomes, things of that nature, but right now we've kind of got our hands tied. As mentioned earlier, we are, we are at capacity as well. So um, the one thing about Bayport, it does have a, a very broad range of housing. Um, in various prices, but it's a very desirable community. So there's not as much turnover or opportunities for people to move in. Um, so as with every city, the values have gone up, but it is 
at least a, a mix of different types and um, of homes. But again, it's just um, you know people come and stay in Bayport for generations, and, and we're very lucky that way. But it does pose a problem for the businesses. Next question. I just wanted to add. I think all of our cities. So that's probably true. Um, but in Oak Park Heights, I know our council's talked a lot about uh, the the we have big parking lots. We, we've all seen that in our community, and as maybe as the retail market changes, um, our, our our development redevelopment opportunities may may expand. Um, we do have proof of parking uh, opportunities, so. Uh, the Lowe's that maybe was the last big box that built in our city, um, did they need to build that big giant parking lot? Well, from the, the corporate side, you know, they want these big sites. Um, but what else could be there? Uh, granted, you have these big power lines that also go through our city, so that's a huge chunk of our of real estate. But there are also these big lots like that, that could be mined for maybe some residential, that they're already sunk with utilities, they're already served, so it makes the redevelopment costs a little cheaper. So we're trying to begin to think about that in our zoning code and our next development concepts is what else is out there? What sites are already served with utilities? Again, these huge parking lots, they kind of sit empty. So it's an idea. And, and real quick, Bob, we did change zoning as well for like the area around Kerrburgers to allow for mixed use, right? So I, it's kind of to, to, to your point that getting more creative with where we can stack those kinds of buildings, I think is going to be the key. All right, we had another question. Well, and Robin, I, thank you. I was going to piggyback Heather Loveland with the St. Croix Valley Foundation, piggyback on Bob's question, and you kind of went there. I think that the, built, the word built out is, is starting to feel like no criticism, but an old excuse, like let's get creative about, you do, we do have zoning power, and I, I'm getting a lot of questions from folks who are asking, okay, remote work, is there an opportunity with zoning to look at some of the now vacant commercial business office spaces and think about, you know, we haven't historically had tons of apartments in some of our river cities, but are there opportunities to convert some of these underutilized previously commercial business office spaces to affordable apartment type living spaces through through zoning and um, creative rebuilding. So not new construction, but but um, you know renovation. And so I'm pleased to hear it. I'm I'm hoping that especially for those of you who are the professional staff that um, that you're able to through your networks of colleagues across the country that we're able to learn together and um, not recreate the wheel, but actually uh, figure out how how we might do this while still maintaining kind of the integrity and charm of our. Of our of our downtown areas, our commercial areas. So please, do it, it's that. it's tough. It's a, you know for a city like Stillwater just to, to touch on it because I think it's a really important thing to talk about for the future health of our city. You know, one of the things that kind of struck me is, is I grew up in a old Victorian house on Sixth Street between Alton and Pine, with a single parent mom who was, who was just getting started in real estate. Many of you know her. Her name is Linda Besk. And, and before she became Linda Best, the successful realtor, she was Linda Best, the broke realtor. And, 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 and we lived in somewhat of a crappy apartment. Um, uh, and it was a, a four unit Victorian building on 6th Street. And, and mom kept it really nice and clean. It was cute and I loved growing up there. I loved being able to ride my skateboard into downtown Stillwater and go swimming in the river and jumping off the bridge and all those fun things. <clears throat> That we're not allowed to do anymore, maybe never were, but I don't know. <laughs> but I, I would drive by, and, and someone, we, we more or less got kicked out of there at some point, and they converted it back into a single family home. And I'd always, and I still drive down 6th Street, just not out of habit, because I love driving by my old house. And I would look at that, and I, I, was, I was like, it was progress to me. I'm like, look at, they restored it to the original beauty, because I love that home. But then I was, I was talking to somebody and they are like, well, that's four less affordable housing units in the city of Stillwater now, right? Like, would there be a spot for my mom and I to live that's affordable now today if we, if we came to Stillwater Broke in the same circumstances when we landed here originally? 
And so I, I know, it, like, at the same time, yes, like, it's more beautiful. Like, the, the yard's better taken care of. It, it's back to its original <laughs> splendor and glory. And, and I was always very proud of that. Um, but also realizing that now there's four less places for people like my mom and I to live in Stillwater. Um, it's a very conflicting thing, right? Like, you want to see those homes taken care of. You want to see the history of those homes preserved. So how do we do that? How do we find that balance is, is tough. It's really tough for me personally um, because I, I love the structures. I love the houses. I don't like to see them run down. Um, and not that it was when we were living there, but it, you know, I get it. And then property owners have rights, right? If they want to buy it and turn it into a single family house, like who, who am I to say they can't, right? Uh, the other thing, the main thing is money, right? Like the city of Stillwater, frankly, can't afford. We just have zero capital or incentive because we don't own any property really that, that could be prime for development. And so when people say we need affordable housing, like developers aren't gonna do it out of the goodness of their hearts. <laughs> right, there, there actually are, there are a handful that do, but more or less, unless they get money from HUD or from the state, they're not doing it, right? There's no incentive for them to do it and the city of Stillwater doesn't really have any economic development levers to see, and we can't force them to just to do it, right? The only way they're gonna build it is if we give them a pile of cash or free money or allow them to build something much larger than the, than the land would support based on our current zoning via variance or something, right? They're, we're just very limited in our economic development tools to incentivize development for affordable housing. It's basically like we have to get the property for free from somebody like Lakeview, hint, hint. Um, and, <laughs> And then we can say, hey, developer, right, we'll give it to you for what we got it for if you make this, you know, affordable. Um, you know, it's something along those lines. So we really have to be creative about it. Hi. Good morning, Mike Leiter here. I um, try to figure out who I'm representing today, but... <laughs> I, I think the Bicycle Friendly Community uh, certification we have just received for the city of Stillwater through Sustainable Stillwater. But now that the new bridge has been open for a couple of years, I don't know the exact date now, but um, how have the traffic patterns changed in each of your cities? What are you doing to adapt to that? Did you predict the way traffic would happen is in fact happening? And how are you making the roads safe and the intersections safe, not just for the vehicles, the motorized vehicles, but for the pedestrians and the cyclists? And please, would you make sure when you press a pedestrian crossing button, it actually does something? <laughs> anyway. I'll take a perfect question for a park. <laughs> Definitely. I would say the traffic patterns have, have shifted uh, more than we expected, especially along Highway 36. Uh, the, the traffic volume is much higher. And it also is increasing now that there's the railroad um, drop over in Richmond, Wisconsin. So we're going, getting more trucks coming across 36. And if we could just get MnDOT to agree with us to drop the speed limit at least through where the stoplights are because of the number of, in, of accidents that do occur. Um, as far as the bicyclist, our city really has a good trail system uh, all the way through and encourages the bicyclists, bicyclists to, to use those trails. But please be aware of the pedestrians. Last night there was a park commission meeting and there was an application for mountain biking um, which we already have the mountain biking trail in, in Oak Park Heights, but to have a training portion there, and that'll continue going through the Park Commission, but to encourage people to actually get out, get exercise, use the trails, walk, leave the um, cars home as much as you can, but obviously the way our city is laid out, you kind of have to have a vehicle if you want to get from my neighborhood to get over to, which I live closer off of Stagecoach, to get from there to Target, because it's quite a long way to haul groceries back home or anything. But the, the traffic patterns have changed, and we have continue to work with others with, like I said, we just have been uh, working the last several years to get the grants and, and bonding and everything to get Norell 
straightened out because there were a lot, as everyone knows, it's hard to get in and out of there because of how the proximity of the frontage road to the main line. So this will make things safer there. When the construction was done at Oak Green Greeley, that was all pulled back to make that safer. And then likewise, um, on the north side for Osgood, that frontage road is pulled back, but now we've been working with Washington County to get the south frontage road straightened out, which is supposed to be done this year, so we'll see if that happens. Um, but continuing to look at opportunities to make things safer for everyone and also make you, we, the buttons are there, as you mentioned, for pedestrians to cross, but in certain instances, you really have to be fast because um, some of the uh, motorists are not paying attention for the, the pedestrians. You yeah, have a unique perspective on that. My son was hit by a driver right behind Menards while crossing the crosswalk with the, the beacons going on there, and that's an inattentive driver. Not much you can do about that, but yes, the uh, traffic patterns certainly have increased along 36. I had a good friend that lives in Sanctuary Lake, Elmo, and he said, Charles, did you know there was going to be this much traffic? I said, well, what do you think was going to happen? They said, we're in the new bridge. It's going to get hammered. So, um, yeah, I, I used to work for the DOT. I've been in highway construction for pretty much all my career, so I, I kind of expected that amount of traffic. My parents live in New Richmond, so I use that bridge quite frequently. Um, obviously, trying to make Highway 36 safer is in everybody's interest in our community. Um, Manning project at, at, at 36 is really a, a good start to that. Um, obviously the DOT needs to work with the cities to get municipal consent to do anything on 36 uh, as, they, as they touch the city. So the next project that Lake Elmo and Grant are, are working with uh, Washington County, who's a really, really great partner um, for transportation projects. they got great leadership, and so, at least in, in my opinion. And so we got um, Casaw 17, Lake Elmo Avenue, and 36 is kind of the next um, one down the line. And if we could get rid of all the ag grade crossings, uh, obviously Keats, where we have a right in, right out, is um, it's more difficult to get in and out of there just because of the uh, lack of vehicle uh, gap spacing on 36 with the speeds that they are and, and, and no signals at Hilton any longer or, or Hadley. So, um, we're, we're trying to get some bonding at the state level for that project. It'll, it'll certainly cost some money from the locals and part of that. Um, and it's going to need a unique uh, design emphasis just because of some of the, there's a church on the corner and some close businesses on the grant side. So, um, you know, I think that Lake Elmo is, is a wonderful place. And actually, all of the, the East Metro area has some great county roads for, for bicycling with the shoulders and the activity there. And, and certainly, we're on, in the city level, trying to make sure we make our connections with our trails. Um, what do we call it? Oh, the Central Greenway Corridor? Central Greenway Corridor um, to, to get the trail connectivity throughout our city with our different developments. So. Um, at that. So a year ago we had the Highway 95 project through Bayport. It took place during COVID. It was kind of a double whammy for our businesses, which was unfortunate, but need to be done. Um, it's uh, a lot. Our construction is over. Everyone's back to business. It looks nicer. It's um, our, and the under, um, water and sewer were, were refreshed at the same time, so we didn't have double disruption at that time. At, when we did that project, we were meant to put in three different um, crossings with flashing lights so that um, they're uh, periodically through the city. We also still kept our flags for pedestrians to get across because it's, you know, um, sometimes even with the flashing, it doesn't seem like it's enough to gain attention. MnDOT doesn't like our flags, but uh, so far, we've been able to keep them. Um, we do still have people that dash across regardless. You know, you can put in flashing lights, and um, it, uh, it's still kind of a risk. So 
uh, traffic going through Bayport. Uh, we would like to see, we would have liked to have seen uh, MnDOT drop our speed limits as well, but um, that was not uh, not in their favor. So, um, so we just, we haven't, according to their statistics, MnDOT statistics are that a number of vehicles going through Bayport is has not increased dramatically. We'll be watching for what happens with Excel and the redevelopment there. Um, but speed is still an issue. Uh, we also looked into trail possibilities during that project. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the way that it was going to be designed, car doors would have and would have opened into the path of the bikers. So we ultimately decided not to go that route. Um, but we are looking for possibilities, and we just had that discussion again last night about the need for trails and um, bringing people down to Mabel's for ice cream and, and other restaurants. So uh, perhaps in the redevelopment of XL and, and maybe with the railroad opportunities, there could be trails there, um, but definitely want to uh, extend that, that system through our community and down to Afton. So. Questions? Great. Um, we are almost out of time. I, I do want to mention that the uh, CVB, the Discover Stillwater entity, is working with Explore Minnesota to get some statistics on point of interest counts, demographics, all those things. So uh, that project will start in July. It'll go for an entire year. So we'll be able to get some really good numbers and good metrics to have these folks take a look at, public safety to take a look at. And um, you know that will help project and help plan and forecast for the future. So we are out of time. I want to thank all of you so much. I, I, I think this is a great event. Um, these uh, local leaders, elected officials, and their team—they work really hard for not a lot of, you know, uh, gratitude. Um, it's it's tough jobs to uh, you know be at the top, but they do a great job and they work collaboratively, collaboratively, and that really helps all of us. I also uh, want to thank the Lowell Lynn, they're great partners. Um, they will keep the food out if you weren't able to um, get something to eat. Feel free to stick around, and also stick around and talk to these great folks. So uh, with that, thank you very much for coming today. I hope to see you in the very near future at one of our chamber events, and have a wonderful day.